Hello everyone and welcome to my presentation on cloud-based ETL processes with Azure Data Factory and Azure Functions. My name is Benjamin Kettner, I am CTO of MLPA Consulting GmbH and I am located in Berlin, Germany. Now, of course, I don't know where you're tuning in from, um, but as you can see, I am in the comfort of my home office and since this is a pre-recorded session, You'll be in the fortunate or unfortunate, depending on who you ask, situation to have me there with you twice. Once on screen on the video and once up here or down here, over there or over there, wherever your chat window is located. So if there's any questions during this presentation, I'd be very happy if you would ask them in the chat and I encourage you to do that because this gives me the ability to interact with you and try to answer all those questions for you and hopefully make this an even better experience for you. But let's go back to the presentation and uh, dive right into the topics of today. And the first thing I would do, like to do with you is give you an idea of why I'm doing what I'm about to do. So I'm trying to help you understand the need for what I'm going to show you. Um, if you've seen modern data warehouse architectures, you'll probably have come across things like this, where you have multiple sources, you have databases, you have flat files, but other than data warehouses that you had on premise, more often than not, you have software service solutions. For example, I worked with a customer where we have uh, Jira as a data source. You have web APIs that you would like to plug into and pull data from. And finally, you have streaming data. And all of these sources need to be incorporated into your, I call the data warehouse here. I'm not going into the technology of the data storage. I'm rather on the ETL part. So on the transformation part, how can we get the data from those sources to a destination of our choosing? And let's think about the answers here. For the first few um, things, the sources, the answer is quite clear. So if you copy data from a database, Azure Data Factory has you covered. There's copy data tasks and these copy data tasks will help you copy data from almost all databases to your data warehouse. However, you might need a gateway if the database you're dealing with is on-premises, but there's a good chance that the Data Factory will have you covered. Same goes for flat files. If you have flat files somewhere, uh, Azure Data Factory and copy data tasks have you covered. Now, if we're coming to software as a service solutions, it's a bit more complicated because there's a huge lot of software as a service solutions that are supported by Azure Data Factory. And if, you, if your software as a service solution is supported, then it's pretty easy because then you have connectors to just pull the data from there. But if not, you'll have to think of something and what something means I'll come to a bit later. Web APIs and even more delicate streaming data. How should we deal with these? Of course, web APIs, if it's a pretty standard API, you can use the uh, web activity in Azure Data Factory. But if your API has some kind of custom authentication, has some kind of specialty, if you need to iterate, if you need to do weird stuff, it gets more and more complicated. So the further down we move, the more unclear a possible solution gets. And the aim of my talk today is to show you the one solution to rule them all the one solution to find them, the one to solution to bring them all and in darkness bind them in the land of Azure where the data lies. Well, unfortunately, this is not Lord of the Rings, so I'm not going to give you the one solution that solves all these problems, 
but I'll give you an idea of how to tackle some of the issues that you might encounter and I'll try to give you some recipes, some best practices, some patterns that you can follow in certain scenarios that will help you work with the data and make uh, faster progress to include your data into your solution. And especially if you were an on-premises ETL integration services person, like I once was, then to many of these issues that we've seen on the previous slide, your answer will probably be script task or strip, script component. However, script tasks and script components aren't available in Azure Data Factory. But there's, of course, a replacement for, or not a replacement, but there's something that we can use in the way that we used to use script tasks and script components. And that's Azure Functions. And now I'd like to talk a bit about Azure Functions, because if you're an Azure guy, if you know your way around Azure solutions, if you're very familiar with the different services that are available, this might not be so important for you. But if you're more of a database and uh, ETL person, then this might be new to you. So I'll give you some key features that I think are important when you start working with Azure Functions. So I'll do a really, really quick dive into what Azure Functions are. So let me get started with that. So the first thing I would like you to know about Azure Functions is that they are triggered by events. Meaning an Azure Function is a piece of code that sits somewhere in the cloud. And when a certain event happens, this piece of code is executed. The events that you can use for triggering your functions can be many different events. You have a broad variety of triggers that you can choose from to trigger your function. For example, you could use an HTTP trigger, meaning that if you place an HTTP request on a specified endpoint, your code is executed. Or you could use a queue trigger, meaning that if a, an item is placed in a certain queue, in a predefined queue, your function is executed. So we have many different triggers that help you actually place functions at different places in your processes. And I'll show you a few of them later in my examples. This flexibility uh, is uh, also reflected in the fact that they can be implemented in many different languages. In my examples, you'll see C Sharp and .NET Core. Um, however, you can even extend Azure Functions to use your favorite programming language, if you want that. There are examples for that online if you want to have, for example, Azure Functions in Go or Erlang, if you feel like it. That's things you could do. Now, Azure Functions can be classified as compute on demand, meaning if there's a demand, that is, if there's an endpoint called or if there's a, uh, an item in a queue, um, the computation starts and is executed. And Azure Functions are serverless, meaning that for an Azure Function, you don't have to care about how many cores of CPUs, how much RAM, you need to execute your code because all this can be handled by Azure Functions for you. I'm saying it can be handled because of course you can add an Azure Function to an app service plan where you have specified hardware resources that are available. So you have a choice, but you can execute functions as serverless instance. And having said that the lifespan of a function is basically when the event triggers it until it's finished the code, executing the code. That means that naturally, if you think about it that way, functions do not have the possibility to persist data between different calls. However, there is an extension that enables you to handle state, um, that enables you to pass data throughout different executions to persist data and to use that data in future executions. And we'll see some of that later as well. 
But after all that introduction, introduction to the problem that we're facing, introduction to the technology that I like to use to solve that problem, let me maybe do one more slide of introduction and introduce myself. As I said, I'm from Berlin. I'm CTO of MLPO Consulting. A long, long time ago, I did a PhD in applied mathematics. However, I am very well tamed in the meantime. So I've learned to talk without the use of formulas, or at least without the excessive use of formulas. Sometimes I can't help myself, but today we'll be able to deal with that. Since this summer, I'm a Microsoft MVP and I'm leader of the local past chapter here in Berlin. And as you can see in my background, uh, I am a bit of a music nerd, a data nerd, and I have a wonderful daughter who's asleep at the time of this recording. But um, this, and for me, it's really great to have the opportunity to be able to speak at a conference like this, to have the chance to talk to you here, to present my work here. And what I would like to say is that me presenting here and, and showing you what I'm doing would not have been possible uh, without uh, the sponsors and especially Microsoft sponsoring this event and without the great organizers of this event. So uh, please make sure to support them in any way that you can. Visit the exhibition hall, uh, make sure to interact with uh, the organizers of this event as good as you can because this is a really brilliantly organized event. So that's one thing I would like to say. But back on topic. Why do I like serverless computing? For me, serverless computing takes the platform as a service idea. So the idea of not having to deal with compute power to the next level, because it even takes away the woes of having to deal with scalability, having to deal with com provisioning compute power, thinking about what compute power do I need for which application. All this can be taken away from you if you work in a serverless mode, which is really great. And the next thing is that in a serverless environment, you pay only for your consumption. And in some scenarios that might not be so tempting, however, in an ETL scenario, this can be really great because in an ETL scenario, you have periods of time where you have very high demand. We need to start many processes where many things need to happen. And then throughout the day, all of a sudden, once your daily load is done, your demand drops. If you're not talking about stream analytics, uh, working with streaming data, but usually after your load is done, your demand drops. And of course, this fits perfectly with uh, serverless, because that means if, you're, uh, if your demand drops, if you don't call your function, you don't pay for it. It just sits there and costs nothing. And that fits very well, in my opinion, with ETL processes. But enough talk, I would like to give you an example of how to use Azure Functions for ETL process and where to use them. And to get this example, first I'll do some introduction and show you uh, a very simplified example of what I'm dealing with. To explain to you um, what I'm doing, I would like you to meet my friend Bob. Bob is the most friendly guy you've ever met, and he has a really impressive beard. And I must say uh, that any similarity to people known to the data platform are purely coincidental. So my friend Bob, like me, is a music fan. And like me, he loves to go to live concerts, loves to go to festivals, loves to see music played live. However, we all know that Corona said you cannot do that, Bob. So like me, Bob is a bit disappointed. Okay. But like me, Bob has found a remedy by just listening to music all day on his headphones while he's working. And my friend Bob is not only a music fan, he's also a geek. So what Bob has done, he's implemented Bob's str music streaming API. So he has implemented a service where he published the playlists that he listened to throughout the day to give me the chance to listen to the same music and to give me the chance to be as productive as he is, which I will never be, but I can at least attempt to be. And 
Bob, being the guy that he is, decided that it would be a good idea to secure Bob's music streaming API, but not secure it with a standard authentication protocol, but with a protocol that he invented and that he tried to sell several times to Microsoft, but that they never bought from him. And it's called Basic Easy Access Resource Defense, so Beard. And with all that said, I would like to show to you Bob's music streaming API in a short demo. So in order to show to you Bob's music streaming API, I'll pull up Postman. And for those of you who are not familiar with Postman, Postman is a tool that you can use to submit web requests, defined web requests, also post requests to APIs to endpoints. So I use Postman to communicate with Bob's music streaming API. And the documentation for Bob's music streaming API says, first, you have to do an authentication call. And I've prepared that call here. What happens here is that you have a call that's called an, an endpoint, an, a REST endpoint that's called get beard. And you call that as a get request and you pass to that uh, endpoint a parameter called mustache and that mustache contains a encoded string. And if you do that, Bob's music streaming API, Bob's beard uh, uh, security mechanism will return, will answer and return to you another beard, a goatee. And now that you have the mustache and the goatee, you have a full beard and you can use that to query Bob's music streaming API. Now the second endpoint that Bob's music streaming API offers is in an endpoint called get playlist. So again, as before, you can see we have an endpoint called collection slash get playlist. This one doesn't take any parameters. It just returns to you the playlist Bob most recently listened to. So let's try it out. And if we call that, what we get returned is an array of songs, well, of numbers, actually. But me being a mathematician, that's fine, because I can clearly see the music in these numbers, but still not actually what we're looking for. So I can call that endpoint several times. Each time I get a different playlist because Bob keeps hopping playlists every now and then. And the next endpoint that Bob implemented and showed to me was get song. So he has another endpoint collection slash get song. And collection slash get song takes as argument on the on the uh, on the URL string a song ID from the playlist. So let's just pick the first one here, copy that, and paste it here into our query. So we can do that um, here, and we want to query find out what song num song number fifty five is. So let's query that again. And what happens is I find out that there is a song with an ID of 55 played by a band with an ID 6, whatever that might be, and the name NIB. Okay, so the next thing that I might have want to know is what band is hidden behind number 6. So I can query the next endpoint, and the next endpoint will be to query the get band endpoint. Makes sense somehow, right? Query that endpoint and find out, okay, number six is Black Sabbath. So apparently my friend Bob is a bit into rock music. Makes sense somehow. With all these requests, what I haven't shown to you is that I pass as a header the beard, which comprises of the mustache and the goatee. So this is something that I do with each request. And now you can see why I'm using Postman to demo this API that Bob developed and not my web browser. Okay, so what I do next is um, I have a look at a few playlists. Okay, and I look and I browse through playlists. Okay, I get another playlist, I browse through that one, and I get another playlist. Okay, and I get another playlist. 
Um, what strikes me as odd is that for some reason number 101 seems to be in almost every playlist that Bob listens to. So let's use the API to find out what number 101 is and let's query uh, the get song endpoint with the ID 101 and see what this one song is that Bob is so mad about. And one song that Bob is listening to, okay, this is a bit strange, but well, maybe we're lucky and maybe uh, band ID 11 is some kind of cover band that covered, um, that covered this uh, song from when my hair wasn't gray. And let's find out, let's hope for the best and see what artist Bob keeps listening to every day in every playlist he listens to. Oh no, oh no, I've, I've lost a huge bit of respect for Bob right now. But that doesn't matter. Okay, what matters now is that you've seen that we have several endpoints in our API. So if we want to find out the songs Bob listened, through, listened to throughout the day, what we would have to do is first we get the playlist that he listened to, then we iterate the IDs of the songs to get each song title and find out which artist it is by, and then we would iterate the IDs of the bands to find out what band wrote the song, just as we just did with this beautiful piece of art. And so if we want to incorporate that kind of data from a web API with non-standard means of authentication, then um, we need to have several calls to that API. And with that demoed, I would like to go over back to PowerPoint and talk to you about some data extraction strategies. How could you get data out of that API? How could you get that data extracted in order to persist it in your data warehouse? Now, the first strategy, the first approach, and the, the approach most customers implement first would be to do it all in the ADF, which is quite reasonable for many solutions. But let's go through the process first. The process will be in ADF, you have a web activity that calls the authentication endpoint to, with the mustache to get the goatee to assemble the beard. We'll then use that in the next request to query the playlist to get this playlist which is on the top right, which will return you an array of song IDs. Then, and that's at the right bottom, you would iterate that those song IDs using a for each loop. And in that for each loop, you would have a web request to get the song by the ID. That would contain the band ID. And then you would have a web request to get the band from that ID and you would persist everything. So that would be the first and very, very, in many cases, even very suitable approach to query that data. And what does it mean? What are the consequences? I'm trying to phrase everything as neutral as possible because I'm not shaming anyone and saying this is a bad idea to do it that way. This can be the best idea to do it that way. Um, but there are certain consequences that you should be aware of if you implement your solution in that way. And those consequences I would like to highlight. So the first consequence will be that your error handling happens 100% and only in ADF, which is really a great thing because you have one go-to place to see if your process was successful or failed. Everything is in one place. This really helps immensely if you want to to check on your on the status of your load. However, it also means that during the entire process, from getting the beard at the top left, to the top right getting the song list, to the bottom left again to get the bands, the entire time your integration runtime would have to be up and running because it's all uh, tasks, web activities, pipelines in Azure Data Factory. And that means that this 
resource that is quite expensive compared to other cloud resources. I'm not saying it's overpriced, but it's it's one of the more costly Azure resources. You will have that running the entire time. And now you might think, well, what's the big deal? It might start to be a big deal if Bob's streaming API is slow. And believe me, from experience, there are painfully slow APIs. There are APIs that can drive you mad because they use seconds to respond. And during the entire time you have this thing ticking in the back and costing money without doing anything but waiting for a reply. And then you do that in a loop. And let's assume that you're not querying 50 songs that Bob listened to. But let's, let's assume that you're querying an endpoint that delivers you on the first level 1000 IDs and then 100 IDs and then everything grows exponentially and you get so many calls and you wait and wait and wait and the streamlining and par implementing parallelism in the right steps and being able to uh, fan out is really hard in this way. You can set a degree of parallelism in your loop but you set that to a certain number and what if your data doubles the next day or halves then you might need to adapt uh, uh, then you might need to to change your load logic again and this is always not a good idea if it involves you to do things manually next thing is this is a, a synchronous process so we'll fetch one then fetch the next then fetch the next there's very little parallelism in there only in the loop if we implement it that way and this of course leads me to the question can we do better than what we just saw and in an overreaction that i often see if i explain the problems of such a process that might be painful for such a process what happens next is that somebody goes there and says, okay, we'll do it all differently. And we'll do, <coughs> sorry, we'll do everything in Azure Functions. You told us functions are a great thing. I'll do everything in Azure Functions. Meaning, I'll just have the Azure Data Factory to kick off the first Azure Function. The Azure Function then does the authentication, gets the beard, gets the playlist, iterates the songs, then gets the songs, then gets the bands. And so on. So it's all in one function. I just trigger an HTTP endpoint once and it does the full process, which is great for manageability because I only have to call one endpoint from my Azure Data Factory. However, of course, usually going from one extreme to the other doesn't solve the problems but just creates different problems. So let's think about for a second what kind of problems this creates. The problems this approach creates is first off, I'll have to do error handling both in ADF and in the Azure function, which is something that I can't get rid of if I use an Azure function. Then this Azure function will have to have some kind of error handling. It might fail in itself and I might have to check why it failed. Um, What's great is that the expensive integration runtime is only needed once to kick off the entire process. And basically after that, I can finish the integration runtime. If I don't depend on the result for a next step, I can just send my integration runtime to sleep. I can just stop everything and I'm fine. The process is running independently of my integration runtime. However, again, we have to handle timeouts if certain requests fail or hang and we'll have to do all of that in our Azure function code. And the same goes for the streamlining and parallelism. If we want parallelism in this approach, we'll have to implement threading. And boy, have I implemented threading in my life. And I hate it. It's really annoying. I really don't enjoy it. There's always things you forget. There's always issues with debugging. It's always a pain. And 
implementing threading is not nice. Now you might have some encounter where you say, okay, no, I, I like building threaded, implement, implementing threaded code. Go ahead, be my guest, thread away. But for me, if I can avoid it, I'd rather try to avoid it just because it adds a level of complexity to your code. And if that level of complexity is not necessary, if you can get rid of any level of complexity in your code, my advice is to get rid of it. Because most of the time, the extra levels of complexity will be what fails and what causes you headaches and short nights. So I think having to do all this yourself even though the threading library in, in .NET is really, really good, it's not a very nice way of working. And again, this is a fully synchronous process. If I don't fan out, if I don't spawn threads by some magic logic, everything will go step by step. And that means it will take possibly painfully long and if, again, my API is slow, what will happen is I will come to some point where I have, uh, where I have uh, timeouts for my function. And if this happens, you will be, tempted by, will be tempted by looking how can I increase the timeout of a function. And you'll find several solutions on the web because many people have asked that. But my advice is, if, you're, if, if you have a need to increase the timeout of a function, either you're, implement, you're not implementing the process in a manner that suits the thinking of fun functions, that suits the function's pattern, or you're implementing a process that does not suit the pattern. So either your implementation is not matching the pattern, the technology you use, or the entire process doesn't match. I've encountered very, very few situations where it was actually the process that didn't match the functions pattern. Most of the time it was the implementation. So again, the question will be, can we do better than that? And again, my answer will be, yes, we can. So with the next approach, I'm going to show you an approach where I try to remedy those pain points that I saw here. So the next approach um, is a data extraction strategy where we try to make the entire process asynchronous. And let me talk you through that process again. So the first thing I do is, again, I initialize from my data factory, which mustn't necessarily be a data factory, but I initialize from the data factory my function does its authentication, gets the beard, then gets the playlist, and is returned the array of song IDs. And now, instead of working with these song IDs directly, what I do is I place all these in a Azure storage queue. Queues come with storage accounts for free, and you can just place items in that queue. And as I mentioned before, Azure Functions have many different triggers. And one of the triggers that we have is, fortunately, a storage queue trigger. So now, what happens if I place an item in my storage queue is my function gets triggered to get the information of that song. And if I go a step further, and if I now have an serverless function and I place 100 items in that storage queue, then Azure and Azure Functions will take care of scaling. So they'll just scale up and you'll see more and more instances running to get songs. And I don't have a thing to do a thing to get that scalability. It's given to me by free by using serverless functions and a storage queue to decouple the process of getting the playlist and then next getting the songs. And now I've got all these songs and I've got the band IDs. And now of course I can do the same thing. I just take another storage queue and place the band IDs of the bands that I want to know into that storage queue. 
And then again, I can have another function that's triggered by that second storage queue that finds out and gets all those bands. And this is a pattern that I like to use a lot. Because if my API is slow, it doesn't matter. If my entire process gets complex, it doesn't matter. And I'll explain a bit more here. Because the consequences of doing it that way, and you'll see code to do it that way in a moment, but the consequences if I implement that pattern are, of course, again, I'll have to do error handling in my Azure Data Factory and in my function. And again, my integration runtime will be only required once when I initialize the entire process. But I've broken up the process of getting the playlist, iterating the song IDs, getting the song information, getting the band information for each song. I've broken that up into getting the playlist as one step, queuing the items of the playlist. The second call is getting the songs. And the third call is getting the bands. And that means each single request, each single unit is atomic, is very small and can run by itself and can run fast. So the, it's much less likely that I run into timeouts by implementing it that way than it is if I implement it all in one big flow. Okay, so this is a huge benefit of implementing it that way. Also, I have this, uh, this feature called resiliency. Now, what happens if one of my API calls, for example, one of my get band calls fails? If I implement it all in one function, then I'll have to, well, implement some error handling. Say, what do I want to do if that fails? Do I want the others to run? Do I want the others to stop? What should happen? If I do it wrong, it will all fail. If I do it in ADF, I can say, okay, up to five of these calls can fail and then please stop the process. If I do it in Azure Functions via a queue, it doesn't matter because the single processes don't see each other. So the entire process will complete even if one strand of, of data will not complete. If this is desired, and for web APIs more often than not it is, then this is a great way of implementing it. If you say, okay, I want all or nothing, then I'll have to log execution results and, and handle those execution results. But if I say, okay, I'm doing 1 million calls to that REST API today, and if one of them fails, I actually really don't care. I want to be informed how many failed. I can see that in, in the logging. But I really don't care. I want as much of the data as I can. Then this is a great way of implementing that because you get that resiliency for free. It's just within the pattern. And the great thing is the parallelism that you want is also for free because the fan out like if my queue gets longer, if I add the items to the queue, more instances of my function spawn. That's something I don't have to do. It's done automatically. And that's very, very nice because I don't have to handle it. It's all handled for me by Azure Functions. I don't have to take care. And my entire process is asynchronous. So does that one get song call in the beginning take too long? It doesn't matter because the other 200 went through and I'm already getting the bands as this is still completing. I don't care. So I've decoupled the entire process and thereby made it more stable and thereby also made it more, made it more robust, made it faster and made it better designed and enabled myself to fetch larger amounts of data without running into issues. Because if you do it all in one function or all in ADF, at some point, you will reach this point where if you do it in ADF and you pass the results set, you get this message and this is a really dreadful message. I really hate that message that my result set is too large to iterate and I'll have to implement something else. Or I'll get timeouts and this is so painful to implement this all and then keep running or restart. What can I do if I get the time? 
This takes so much time in development. And by fanning out, streamlining and having parallelism and having everything decoupled, I can even say, okay, if all the get banned requests fail, but I have somehow persisted my band IDs that I wanted to fetch, I can just queue them again and just run that part of the process again. I can step into every step of the process without making a change to code. I can just step into it if I need to. And so this is a really nice feature of fetching for fetching huge amounts of data from a endpoint. And so if there's one thing you take away from this session today, let it be that if you have to fetch large amounts of data, if you have to iterate result sets and fetch amounts of data, a pattern with a queue and a queue triggered function can be of great value. So just keep that in mind. If that's the one thing you take from this session, I'm, I'll be very, very happy. But still the question would be, can we do even better than what we just saw? And my answer is, yes, we can do better. Because this is one problem this process. And the problem this process has is, let's assume that the band IDs do not change. There are bands like Iron Maiden who've been alive and kicking for 50 years. Their ID doesn't change for 50 years. Not in Bob's system. And then the question is, do I actually need to fetch the band from the API each time? And of course the answer is no, I don't. I can implement a much smoother process. I could go to the database. That's slightly better because it's under my control and I can scale it up and down. But then I'll have connection limits and if I fan out, I'll have issues with that. So there's something even nicer and that's durable entities. That's what I was talking about right in the beginning of this talk, and that's where things start coming together. Right before I show you the code how to do that. Durable entities are managed objects that you can save and access at a later execution. How is this done? Technically, this is done by the Azure function, storing information about the entity, basically the serialized entity, so a JSON object, in a Azure storage table and retrieving it from there. And by using these durable entities, we enable our function to access that entity and reuse that entity, so reuse the information about what ID, what band was, without having to call an external API each time over and over again, and without calling a database over and over again, because I have it in my durable entity. And the nice thing about that is, of course, I could implement all of that myself, but durable entities are a thing and they're there. And you can just use them to retrieve the information and to store the information. And you don't have to care about storage formats, you don't have to care about keys, you don't have to care about dealing with that information and storing that information because it's done for you. And again, the framework helps you develop these things much faster and much more efficient and gives you the possibility to implement a solution like that with very, very little overhead, which is a great thing because it really helps you implement such a solution very fast. What I would like to do now is go through the code of such a solution for Bob's streaming API together with you. So what I'm going to do now is take you through a solution to fetch data from Bob's streaming API. And in order to do so, I'll walk through the code with you to give you an idea of how easy or how complicated it is to implement such a solution and especially how complicated or he, how easy it is to implement the solution I showed on the last slide, the architecture that we had on the last slide, so where everything is decoupled and where everything uh, is working in queues. And in order to do so, let me pull up Visual Studio and cover the 
picture of my, one of my favorite whiskey distilleries in Laphroaig um, in order to look at code. And we all agree the code is much more uh, pleasing to the eye than whiskey distilleries. So let's do this. Um, the first thing that I want to do with you is to create, before we look at the solution, to create a new Azure function. And for that, we will add a new project. And the project template, if you've installed the Azure function templates and everything, will be Azure function. We'll call it function app 2. Doesn't matter because we'll delete it later anyway. And when we create that, and now you see the first thing that I was talking about, um, we have the option to have several triggers. You can create a function without any triggers. Okay. You can have a blob trigger that fun this function will be run whenever a blob is added to a container. You can have the function run when a document changes in the collection in Cosmos DB. You can have the function run when there is an, uh, an event on the event grid or on an event hub. You can have a function with an HTTP trigger, IT hub of course. We've already talked about queue triggers and queue storage. And we can have service bus as trigger and timers. And we can choose from a selection of languages. The only ones I have installed is .NET Core and .NET Framework. So I'll use v3 and .NET Core. And if I create a function with an HTTP trigger, what will happen is that I get a class and I get a method in that class. So I see my class function one, and I'll zoom into that. I see my, I, I'll see my class function one. And in that class, I see my static method called run. And this is associated with the function name function one. This is all the play code that I get when I first create a function with an HTTP trigger. And the method takes an argument that's the HTTP request and that defines the HTTP trigger. I can say it's a get or post trigger. How do I want to trigger my function basically? And a logger. And then there's some boilerplate code about how to get parameters from the request query and how to get parameters from the request body. So look at that boilerplate code, take your time, do that yourself, and you'll quickly see how easy it is to implement, for example, in REST API. And I'll be honest with you, Bob's Music Streaming API is basically an Azure function with several REST endpoints. Okay, as I said, we'll delete that function because we need, don't need it. Let's have a look at fetching the playlist. So fetching the playlist. Um, my function is implemented in a class that I called load music API. I have several parameters and that's a nice thing. I can set parameters using the um, using the environment variables of the Azure function that I can set in the Azure portal, for example. And I can even set them to uh, Azure Key Vault references. So I can create a Key Vault reference if I want to store my code, my, my password, my keys, my connection strings securely. I store them in a Key Vault and I create a Key Vault reference in my uh, environment variable in my configuration of my function and I'm able to access them from here. Okay, so I have a function that I called initialize load, init load, and this function has a get trigger and no post trigger and HTTP get trigger, so I can call it from a browser. If I call that function, what will happen? Let's go through that. I'll have a query to Bob's, your, to Bob's music API, and I call get playlist. Okay, so at some point I want to execute that query that happens down here. But what do I want with the, to do with the results of that query? I want to store them in a storage queue. So I have to access a storage account, an Azure storage account. 
I read the credentials from my environment, from my key vault, ideally, not in my demo here, but usually I would have a key vault reference here. And I create a queue client that enables me to write data into a storage queue. And once I do that, I initialize the queue and get the reference for the queue. So I have the queue here, the cloud queue. And now I've prepared everything and I'm ready to fetch the first data. So what I'll do is I'll create a new HTTP client to create an asynchronous request. So I create a request to Bob's music streaming API, to that URL that I defined up here, get playlist. And I'll read the result, the body of the result. And this will give me the array of song IDs that we've seen before. And then I loop that array of song IDs. And for each song that's in my list, I create a message in my queue and just add that message to my song queue. And I'm done. I don't do another call to Bob's API. I did one call, one call only, to get the array of song IDs and then I took all those song IDs and I placed them all as messages in the queue. So this is a really atomic unit of work. This is really the smallest thing that I can do. Access the API, get the songs, and place them in a queue. You can't get much smaller than that. And as you've seen, what I've done here is all these requests, all this, all this process is from line 29 to line 53. So it's 24 lines of code. If I remove the braces and the blanks, let it be 25 lines of code that I need to do all that. So this is really one atomic unit. And now I have all the songs in my queue. And now I need a second function that is triggered by that queue. And if I do that, the second function that I can have here is the function process song queue. And it's a bit different than the first function because it uses a queue trigger. And the queue I want to look at is the queue that's called songs to fetch that lies in the blob storage with the connection string I have from my environment. Okay. And I have something that I call a durable client. We'll look at that in a moment. So what happens next? Again, my function is triggered because there is an item in the queue. And what happens is um, I get this queue item and it's passed to me as a argument of my method. And I can go here and deserialize that object. And again, I need a queue client and I need a queue to queue the bands later on, bands to fetch. So you've seen that, that's the same, but with bands to fetch. Um, so I get the song ID from that message. I get the, I deserialize the, the, the message from the queue and I read the song ID from that. Okay. What I do next, of course, I just call Bob's streaming API for that song. And that's again here, my HTTP client doing that call, adding my beard header to uh, authenticate myself. Then uh, using my get query to get the information from there, getting the response, deserializing the sp response, reading the response, and finding the band ID in that response. And now durable entities come to play. What happens now? Usually what I would do is I would place that band into the next queue and have the next function trigger whenever an item is placed into that queue. However, I do something different now. What I do, and of course I could also do that for the songs, but I want to explain it for the bands, because there's less bands than songs. Because most bands that Bob listens to are not one-hit wonders, luckily enough. So what I do now is I have this class called entity ID, and this gives me an ID that I can identify an entity with. And this entity ID is made of the 
uh, the object, an object I have here. We'll look at that object in a moment. And the ID of the band. So it says, okay, um, what I'm looking at is a band state object for the band with that ID. And now I can query my durable client and say, okay, please get the entity with that ID. And I can say, okay, do I know that band? Do I know what ID, what band lies behind that ID? I can have a look and say, okay, does this entity exist? And if it does not exist, then I place my band message in the queue. And if it exists, I'm fine. I have my band. And I can work with that and I can get all the information from there. So let's look at the band status object. The band status object is just an object that serializes the the information I want to store about the band. So when was my entry last updated? What's the name of the band? And what's the ID? And by simply adding those one, two, three, four, five lines of code, I've reduced, significantly reduced, the number of calls that I need to do with Bob's music API. And of course, the process band queue is very simple, doesn't do much. What it does is basically, uh, you've seen the pattern before, so I'll go through that rather, rather quickly. You create a query, you query um, the get band endpoint, but the thing that changes is if I'm in here, then I didn't have the entity for that band. So I create the new entity ID and um, I create the new object and I signal that there is a new entity and I save that entity to my durable object storage. So what I do here is I say, okay, if that band didn't exist, then please store it in the durable object storage. So the next time this function is called, I have the information about that band present already. Now the last thing that I'm gonna do with you is execute this function and see how it works. So for that, I'll place some breakpoints. The first breakpoint I'll set is where my song queue is starting to be processed. And the second endpoint is uh, breakpoint is where I start my load. And the third breakpoint will be where my song ID is placed in the song queue. And if I start that function now, what happens is I get a function host running locally, Azure Function Core tools. And in these that are running locally, I can work with these. And I can see that there's, for example, an HTTP endpoint with get that listens to get requests on this init load URL. Um, there is a queue trigger for processing the band queue. There's a queue trigger for processing the song queue. So let's trigger everything. Let's go to Postman, and I've prepared the request for the initial load, for the init load, and I'll just start the load process. And if I just start the load process, what will happen is the first thing that happens, of course, my trigger fires and tells me, okay, um, my we have to work because I have get requests and I fire I placed a request on the endpoint for that function, so it fires and it tells me we have a request and we need to work. And I'll skip all this fetching data from Bob's music, music API and stuff and just go straight ahead. And this takes a second and go to the place where I have fetched all the songs. So the result is what we expected, an array of songs. I deserialize that and uh, into a dynamic object. This is a dynamic object and I iterate the songs. So the first song that I'm fetching is song number 60. I'm saying placing song number 60 in fetching queue. And I can see that logs that I write are output to this uh, terminal window when debugging locally. Otherwise they're placed in uh, App Insights, for example, or in the logs of your app service. Okay. 
So I've placed the song in the song faction queue. Everything's on pause at the moment. I'll just remove that breakpoint because it might iterate here first. And the next thing that happens is that my song process, my song processing starts. So this queue is triggered and it's triggered with a message in my queue and this message contains my song with the ID 60. So this is just the item I just placed in my queue. And if I'm doing this in the cloud, there might be three or four instances running now processing all these queue items, but I'm debugging locally, so that's fine. So I'm processing the queue item and I can move on and fetch the queue and have a look at what my durable entity says. So this is triggered again because I'm fanning out. I'll just remove the breakpoint. And what I see here, ah, this breakpoint didn't even hit. I know it hits. Okay. What I can see here is that my first function, my first function, my init load has completed, has placed everything in the queue while the second one is still running, which is fine for me because I'm in an asynchronous process. And now I fetched a band status for a band target and I can have a look. Does this band status already exist? Yes, it exists. So I don't have to fetch it again. And if I continue now, what will happen is I'll get the information here that the entity already exists. So I get the information that the band Metallica was fet fetched in previous load. The band named ACDC was fetched in previous load. And so I don't have any calls to my process band queue function because all the bands have already been processed. Okay, so now let's go back to PowerPoint and wrap it all up. So back in PowerPoint, I'd like to wrap it all up. And to wrap it all up, I would say functions are useful in many scenarios. I've, implied, I've applied them in many scenarios and very often they've been very useful to find my goals. And what makes them really great and flexible is the availability of triggers because I can implement a huge variety of triggers and I can implement different patterns and this helps me design a function that really meets my meets my needs it's late sorry um, patterns you've seen is that i can use queues for asynchronous data processing so if you remember the first function was already completed while the second function was still running which is fine because i'm asynchronous my integration runtime can continue doing other stuff while this entire process is running. You have seen how we can use queues if we have nested REST queries to decouple the processes. And you can have seen how we can use durable functions to reduce database or API calls. And if that's the key takeaway, if, you, if the thing that you're saying after this is, I might have to look into functions and they're really helpful, then this would make me very happy. If you have any comments, ideas, suggestions, uh, I'm available in the chat for the next 10 minutes until the session is over. I've left some time at the end for us to be able to chat. Um, I'm very open to suggestions, to comments. Please get in touch. My contact information is on the slide. And thank you for bearing with me. Thank you for say, staying in this session and thank you for listening to what I have told you. And I hope that this was interesting and helpful for you and this will help you build better ETL solutions in the cloud. And of course, there's also ways for you to take not only knowledge, but even uh, hard prices from this, um, from this event and these ways you can see here. So thanks a lot. Stay in the chat, ask me questions. I'm available and thanks for staying. Have a great day.